So if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3, and I'll be reading from, from verses 1 to 15. And I'll be reading from the NIV. Now Moses was standing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that, through the, that, that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight why the bush does not burn up. Now when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Mo Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Now who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generations to generation. Well, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome. My name's James. I'm the pastor here, the lead pastor, and it's great uh, to be here opening up God's Word today. So keep your Bibles open. We're going to keep looking at the book of Exodus, chapter 3, and a bit of chapter 4. Now, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love you to have one in your hands. So there's one at the back. Go and grab one if you'd like, and you can take it with you so that you can have your own. So we're in, in the book of Exodus, and we're we're, I think we're up to week five, and so we've got plenty of weeks ahead of us as we continue to see how God makes himself known. Last week, it was the 21st of February, and on the 21st of February, we celebrate, well, me and Ali, my beautiful wife, we celebrate our wedding anniversary. Now, for me, luckily, it comes seven days after Valentine's Day, so when Valentine's Day comes around every year, I should remember that in seven days' time, we're going to celebrate our wedding anniversary. So last Monday, we celebrate not this Monday, this week, but the last Monday, the 21st of February, we celebrated our 13th wedding anniversary and we went out in style. It, it was, we, we thought we'd celebrate, we just moved house and so it, it, was, it was a night to remember and so we went out and I bought some pizza, brought some pizza at, at the new pizza joint. Well, it's not, we've moved house, so we found this new pizza joint, so we went and got two pizzas and we sat down and we had the three boys and we sat down, ate pizza and we watched the movie Minions together. Now, that, that, that sort of gives you some sort of insight into who we are as a couple and how we celebrate wedding anniversaries. You might be the opposite. You might go out to a five-star restaurant. You'll go out and have a five-course meal. You'll do over the Sydney Harbour Bridge. You'll look out over the ocean and you look into each other's eyes and you gaze and you romance about life. Now, that might be you and, and it reveals something about who you are. But after 13 years of marriage, actually having 14 years of knowing Ali, from the first moment I met her, I am continually learning things about who she is, from the way she interacts with other people, from the first conversation I had with her, through the way that she loves our three boys and the way that we as a husband and wife and, and the way she deals with me, over time what's happening is she is revealing her character 
through the way I see her relationships with you and with other people, we see who she really is. And you get to see who we are as a couple by having pizza and watching the Minions together. It's exciting. But today, we've we, we got something even far better because God reveals himself to us. See, in this passage in chapter 3 of Exodus, God is actually revealing himself to us. Maybe you're here today and, and you're here for the first time, or maybe you're not a Christian, or maybe you're here just checking out who God is, and you think, like, just wouldn't it be good if I had a lightning bolt from heaven? Wouldn't it be just great if God would just make himself a little bit more known to us? Well, here today, God is going to reveal himself to each of us, and in fact, like Moses had an encounter with God at the burning bush, all of us have burning bush moments. It may not be a fire, but today we are going to encounter and see who God is. He's going to reveal himself to us. Because the book of Exodus is about him making himself known. And so today we're going to look at that. What does God reveal in this passage of Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4, some of chapter 4? He's going to reveal a few things. He's going to reveal God's holiness. He's going to reveal his holiness to us today. He reveals God's holiness. Look, look at verse 1. We've got to set the scene. The last couple of weeks, RJ's been going through that and we've seen Moses' life. We saw last week that God confronts Moses' self-identity. He calls Moses into service. But verse 1, it, it sets the scene for us. Have a look there. Because see, in verse 1, in the eyes of the modern world, even in the eyes of an Egyptian, verse 1 is the tragic demise of a washed up old man. Have a look at verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law of all people, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, or which we probably think is the Mount Sinai. But verse 1, as we, we glance over, it doesn't seem that pivotal, but it's actually set in the scene. When you think about Moses' story, you think, man, really? The demise of this old man. A man who's gone from probably being in, who was living a part of the most powerful family in the known world under the rule of Pharaoh. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was educated. He had everything. He lived in a palace. And he goes from a palace to a tent. He goes from being the son of the daughter of Pharaoh to being the son-in-law of Midian. The priest of Midian, Jethro. He goes from the life-giving water of the Nile that they sort of was the life-giving Nile to the wilderness of Midian. A finely educated man who is lowly and washed up at the age of 80 and now he is a shepherd. By all accounts, this is horrible. It's tragic. Loss of power, loss of position, loss of fame, loss of riches. A man who is doing one of the most menial and degrading jobs any Egyptian would think you could do. So we know that from the book of Genesis, the Egyptians didn't think much of shepherds. And yet it's the very place in which he encounters God. It's the very place that God wants him to be. See, God is humbling him. It's the very place in which he, he encounters the living God. Have a look at verses 2 to 4. You know, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames. Now, when we picture angel, I think you're probably going to picture Hollywood you may be picturing a, a white being that shines with a halo on its head with wings and it's, ah. And you, when you think of the word angel, we think of that. But actually, angel just means messenger. It means a messenger of Yahweh appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Now, isn't it interesting that all our kids' stories say this is the story of the burning bush and yet the burning bush doesn't burn? So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And then when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And what does Moses say? He says, here I am. As Moses heard sheep at a very old age, he sees fire and it grabs his attention. See, you know, Moses has seen a burning bush before. Like, you know, and, but it catches his attention. Like, you know, when you see a bush burning, when it first takes off and it really takes off and it gets hold of the leaves of the bush, it goes, whoo, and it just, whoo, I love it. I love fire. It's a whoo. But then what happens after a while, once the leaves are burnt, what happens? The fire just sort of starts to die down. It sort of burns up. But, but Moses is going, I've seen bushes burn before, but hang on, what's going on here? 
He's sort of out the corner of his eyes. What, what's the, that bush is still burning. And so what does he do? He, he wants to go and inspect. And so he, he goes over and he goes over and he, and he has a look at this burning bush. See, fire in the, in the Old Testament or, or fire throughout the Bible or especially fire throughout the book of Exodus, it, it, it represents God's glory. It represents God's purity. It represents God's holiness. It represents God's otherness. And here's the burning bush. In 2017, um, we, we, me and my family, we went on an ag camp by Scripture Union. It's an ag camp where teenage boys would come out to the bush for a week and they would hang out with us and we'd teach them about Jesus whilst they, had, they got to do farm work. And so this year we turned up, we've got three young kids, they're very young at this stage, and we turn up, it's like June and July, it's freezing cold, it's freezing, so you've got to get the fire going. So we've got the fire going, it was roaring, the boys are looking at it, oh, I'm looking, oh, this is great. And we go off and we make the beds because we want to get the boys in sleep while the fire warms the house. And guess what we hear out of the corner of our ear? We knew exactly what happened. I could hear William, our youngest, he tripped and we knew what had happened. He fell and he, his arm got on the fire. And he's, you know, he's screaming and we, we knew instantly. So ours like bop out the room and down there. And we put the tap over him and get the water all over his arm. Thank goodness it wasn't major burning. It's perfectly fine now. But a couple of hours later, he took it pretty well, our youngest world. He took it pretty well. But a couple of hours later, we're sitting there and he's white. He's in shock and he's shaking. He's, he's like, what's just happened? So we take him to the hospital and everything's okay. And so for the next week, you know, we've got fire everywhere, right? You've got to have a fire to cook tea. It's, it was just fire everywhere. And so we imagine what Will's like for the next week. Fire is this sort of terrible He's sort of, he's distant from it. He knows there's something horrific about fire. But at the same time, boys are mesmerized by it as well. Like he still wants to check it out. That's what fire does. It mesmerizes you. You, you. you know it's beautiful, but at the same time, you're terrified by it. It's actually, distru- it's actually a very powerful thing. You're mesmerized by it, but at the same time, it's terrible. It's powerful. And, and here, you know, there's, there's something, Moses is he's mesmerized by it. He's got to go and check it out. But then God speaks and, and he says, take off your shoes. And, and why take off your shoes? Well, God explains why, doesn't he, in verse, because it, it's, oh, you're standing on holy ground in verse 5. This is holy ground. See, God is revealing to Moses his holiness. Holiness is separate. It means set apart. It means set apart from everything that has been made. Holiness is an otherness. So there is a huge distinction between humanity and God. And look at the end of verse 6 though. At this Moses, what's he got to do? He's got to hide his face. He hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. See, this is an awe moment. This is a holy moment. This is a glory moment where he knows and he recognizes whose presence he is in at this moment. It's a moment where God reveals to Moses his holiness. And as he reveals his holiness, he's actually revealing at the same time, we see he's revealing his transcendence. See, or put it another way, God is revealing that he is above us. That's what transcendence means. If we talk about God being transcendent, it means that God is above us. That's what transcendence means. I'm different from you and I am distinct from you. See, God is separate from the universe. God's above it. He rules over it. He's outside the universe of the 50 billion galaxies that we seem to know about. See, transcend means I'm above that. I'm above it. I'm separate from it. God is an all-powerful God who is above us as creator. So he's transcendent. I mean, he's outside. He's, he's above us. Which means actually God does not need you and he does not need me. He does not need creation. You see that? So it's, very, it's an amazing thing to think about God being transcendent above us he's 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 above it all he's, he's not he's not he's not he's not creation no no he's above it and so that means here's the logic of that means that you and me actually can't define who god is 
He's self-defining. See, later on in the book of Exodus, the people of God, they have this moment. They've been redeemed. They've been brought out of Egypt. They've seen the powerful hand of God. Moses is up on the hill. God's speaking to Moses about the law. And they're down the hill with Aaron. They're complaining and they go, you know what? Let's get all our gold together. In Exodus chapter 32, they get all their gold and they, and they make a golden calf. So in that moment, what they're doing is they're trying to define the God who brought them out of Egypt. They've reduced God to a golden calf. We cannot do that. As much as we think about and we want to do it, we are not here to define who God is. He is self-defining. Defining, sorry. God is self-defining. We are in a world today where we go, I like to think of God like this. I believe that God would do this. I can't believe in a God who would act like that. That's a moment where we are defining God for ourselves. Sometimes I even hear Christians go, the God I believe in wouldn't, don't, don't, don't. Now, often in those moments, maybe it's correct, or actually, often it's just us going, I'm going to, this is who I think God is. I can't imagine that the God of the universe would be like this. But actually, when we do that, you know what we're doing? We're actually just creating a God in our own image. We're creating a God of our own defining, of our own desires. This is what we desire God to be. You're just creating a God like you. We, when we define God, the God that you will define and create will just be the image of you, of what you want. I, I like what Tim Chester says. It's going to come on the screen. Tim Chester says this in, in that book that I recommended last week. A God made in our image suits our desires, but cannot help us when we are in need. See, I want, to, I want to ask that question today. When, so, so when I preach or when RJ preaches or when you read God's word, when others speak to you of God, if nothing ever offends you, there's probably a good chance that that's a God of your own making. Does that make sense? If, if you're never offended by the God of the Bible... If I'm never offended as I come and preach and prepare and think, man, that's, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. See, when we're not offended, you've probably created and are worshipping a God that you've created yourself. You've probably created a God that makes you feel comfortable and helps you justify your actions and your decisions in life. But what we're going to find here is that God is who God is. He is who he says he is because what we're going to hear in a moment is that names matter. See, so as God reveals his holiness, he's, he's revealing some other stuff. At the same time, he, he's revealing his holiness and he's going to tell us a name. Because names matter. Now, I don't know about you, but when you have kids, when, you, when you, your wife's pregnant, you guess what you've got to do? You've got to pull the name book out. And you've got to pick names. And that's a fun task, isn't it? Especially when you have a difference of opinion on names. Now, I really didn't care. It's just like, let's just pick some great names. Now, for me, when I pick a name, I don't, give a, well, I don't care one bit about the meaning of the name. I just want it to sound cool. I just want it to, to fit with McCleary. Because my last name's McCleary. You just want to make sure it sounds good. Now, I thought Milton would be a great name for a boy. But my wife said, no, you can't have Milton because it's Milton McCleary. So that's M&M. And so you have this back and forth about names. And you pick names. And you do this. And you do that. And so our first child, we picked We'd picked a boy's name, but we didn't have a girl's name. And so Ali's going in for an emergency C-section, and we're there discussing, what happens if this child comes out and it's a girl? What are we going to name it? And we've got, we've got no hope in the world, and we're just going, I hope it's a boy. And so what do we name our first child? We named him Harvey. And we named our second Finlay. Now, I wanted Finlay, but Al wanted Finlay because Finlay McCleary doesn't go as well as Finlay McCleary. And I'm okay with that. But do you know what their names mean? Like, I'm pretty stoked. Like, I didn't pick him because of this. Harvey means battle warrior. And if you know him, you go, yeah. Finley means fair hair warrior. Now, like, that's just, 
And they're boys, you know, you just like those kind of names. Now, I did not pick them because of that. But here in Exodus 3, names do matter because names tell something about who you are. See, here in, in Exodus 3, we're going to see a name because Moses, he, he has objections over and over again and he, and he says to God, well, what, what is your name? You, you're telling me to go to these people and say, I am going to, God, I'm here to rescue you. God's going to rescue you. And he says, but what is your name? Well, they're going to want to know what kind of, who, who you are. They want to know your identity. And so what does God say there? Look, look at verse 13. Suppose I go. And the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is your name? Then what shall I tell you? And here God speaks. And God says to Moses, I am who I am. Now that's a bit of a surprise. I am who I am. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, which is I am, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. So the name isn't just a, a, a lovely name that God says, this is how you refer to me. No, that the name is who he is. He's telling us something about him and his character and his attributes. I am who I am. Now, we do expect it, maybe we would have said, God is love, or I'm here for this. Then he said, I am who I am. Now, if you look in your Bibles in the Old Testament, you'll see the word Lord in capital letters. That is, I am who I am. It's, it's Yahweh, or Adonai, as the Jews would talk about. Or, if you've got a King James, I think it says Jehovah. Here, it's, 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 this is who he's talking about. When you read Lord in capital letters, it's referring back to here. I am who I am. So your name defines who they are. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. I am who I will be. See, there's no past, there's no present, and there's no future. It's I am eternal. I am who I am. It's, he's, he's saying to Moses, I am who I am. See, God is not dependent on anything or anyone, whereas you and me are dependent on everything and everyone. And so the, I, I think the rest of the book of Exodus, this statement of I am who I am, he's saying I am who I am, I will be who I will be, what we're going to see is that, that God's going to reveal this name as you go through the plagues and redemption. And, and we're going to see through the rest of the Bible that God is going to reveal what it means to be I am who I am. Because see, Moses is questioning this promise of God. See, in this moment, Moses is questioning God. Yeah, really? Are you going to come and rescue these people through me? Have you ever made promises to your kids? Have you ever made promises to friends? You know, I'll often say to my wife, I'll be home in 10 minutes. How often am I at home in 10 minutes? I just can never predict it. You can say, to, you can make promises to your kids. I will pick you up after school tomorrow at 3 p.m. But often we break our promises. Why? We could get a flat tire. We aren't in control of this universe. We can't make up a decision whether we're going to have a flat tire. It's going to be bad traffic. It's going to rain. We don't know what is going to happen. And we make promises we cannot keep. But here, when God says, I am who I am, he's saying, I am who I am. and I'm going to keep this promise. See, God is, in this moment of holiness, standing on holy ground, God is both more loving than we can ever perceive and he's more holy than we can ever comprehend. See, he's telling us who he is. See, God reveals his holiness in this moment. So we aren't to define God, he is self-defining. I, I like what the, the theologian in the 18th century said. This is Jonathan Edwards. He said about when, you know, if, if you were to dream up, if you were to create your God, he says, well, there's many attributes of God that we would choose. Like, you know, God is love, God is gracious, God is compassionate. We'd, if we were to dream up our God, some of the dreams of who God is in our design of who God would be is actually things that the Bible talks about. You know, forgiveness, redemption, grace, love, we'd do that. But I think Jonathan Edwards is very insightful. There is one attribute that we would not dream God to be. That we, if we were to create God, here's, there's one attribute that you and me would never choose. And I think it's an attribute that the church has lost. 
I think Jonathan Edwards is so critical here. Speaking into the 18th century, he's actually speaking to us. And the attribute that we would never choose, Edwards says, is the holiness of God. Because when we choose the holiness of God, it exposes us for who we really are. The holiness is nothing but a problem. See, the holiness of God is a big problem for each one of us in this room. If you are starting to sense this God that you're trying to come to grips with is holy and that you're not just a person who needs a spiritual boost from him and you're not even just a needy person who needs fulfillment, but that you're a sinner and you need forgiveness and pardon. See, when we start to just get a glimpse of the holiness of God, we start to realize there is a huge problem in us relating to God. We start to realize we have a problem of coming into the presence of God. See, if if you're here today and you're starting to realize and starting to have some sort of confidence, as Edwards would say, that you're not, you're starting to have some sort of confidence that you can't come into the presence of God, now you're just starting to get some, you're, you're starting to understand the holiness of God. That the God of the Bible is not made up. You sense that you have a personal problem, that it's not just an abstraction that you're trying to just believe in him, but you have a problem in relating to God. See, one of the ways he says, if you want to be confident that you know the God of the Bible, you start to know the holiness of God. See, when you come into the the presence of the holiness of God, you come to realize that you are actually one of the most, you are an unholy person. You are an exposed person. See, God here in this moment, he reveals, Moses, he reveals to Moses his holiness and he's actually showing us his holiness. But at the same time as he shows his holiness, guess what? It exposes us. It exposes our insecure identities. It exposes each of us for actually really who we really are in his holiness. So how do we understand holiness? Uh, one of the ways we might try to, to picture what's going on here and trying to picture what holiness means is, is if I was to walk down into West Point and into Blacktown Shopping Centre and I was to walk near the train station, if I was to walk along there, guess how I would feel about myself? I'd actually feel okay because there's, there's homeless people. We've got our street ministry out there feeding people today. Like, you know, when you see people on the streets, you think, you, f- you feel better about yourself. You think, yeah, it's all right. I'm going okay in life. But then if I was to pick the most wealthy street in Sydney and walk down it, I'd have sort of a sense of, oh, like, I just don't measure up. So that's, that's, that's a bit of a picture of, of us trying to understand the whole of God. Here's another way probably to think about it. I, I like tennis. Right? So if, if I'm playing tennis with you guys or playing tennis with some young people or, or some of you here, you know, as I play tennis, can I tell you I'm going to feel sort of, we're, good, we're in this together, I'm sort of good at this. I'll feel sort of like, yeah, I measure up. But I wouldn't even have to step foot on a tennis court if Roger Federer just stepped next to me and even if he said hello, how would I feel? I would go, whoa. I compare... In comparison to you, I am nothing. He leaves me. He exposes me. And can I tell you that the holiness of God is way far bigger than that. It exposes us for who we really are. See, Moses, he, 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 he has this moment and he's got objections. Did you notice? There's five objections. If you go into chapter 4, there's, it, it add, like it's, there's, an, there's an objection in verse 11. Who am I, God? Right? That's, a, that's an identity problem. Who am I? Then, then in verse 13, what is his name? That's an objection. Chapter, one of, sorry, chapter 4, verse 1, what if they do not believe or listen to me? That's an objection. Verse 10 and verse 13 of chapter 4, he is objecting. God, do not send me. That's an identity. He has been exposed. He knows he is not up for this task. God, Yahweh has just said to him, I'm going to send you and, and we're going to rescue these people. See, as he comes into the holiness of God, he realizes and is exposed for his inadequacies in life. He's exposed for who he really, really is. Isaiah the prophet, a man of God, when he is in Isaiah chapter 6, where he has this revelation of holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. What is Isaiah's response? His only response is, woe is me. I'm a child of unclean lips. He's exposed for who he really is. 
But it is easy, isn't it? It's, it's easy to build ourselves up when we compare ourselves to other people. It's easier, isn't it? If they're worse than us, we go, oh, I'm, I'm in a house. They're, they're, in, they're in a flat. I've got a great job. They're, they're on the pension. I've got, look at my kids. They're succeeding in school, but oh, their kids are having a bit of a rough time. So it's easy to compare and be pre-consumed by all that, that we start to feel good. But then when we get to the presence of the holiness of God, it's going to really, it's going to expose us for each one of us for who we really are. See, God's, God's just said to Moses, go, go to the elders. Yahweh has said, go to those elders and tell them I've, I've sent you and we're going to rescue these people. Imagine how Moses is feeling at this point. I can imagine Moses thinking to himself, imagine if I go to the elders of Israel at this point. I'm 80 years old, I'm washed up, I'm a shepherd boy. And he comes to them and he says, God sent me. And he sent me, I'm going to rescue him. We're going to do these amazing things and God's going to rescue these people. And imagine how the elders probably will respond. Come on, Moses, who are you? 40 years ago, you left us. You, you murdered an Egyptian. You, you're a shepherd boy, like... Don't come here and tell us what to do. Like, what have you been smoking in the wilderness, Moses? Like, <laughs> and he, he realizes his inadequacies. You know, you wouldn't believe it, guys. I saw a burning bush. Well, that didn't burn up. <laughs> like, come on, Moses. And he's been exposed for who he really is. See, the holiness of God, it, it exposes him. And it exposes us as well. To hit. The holiness of God exposes us for who we really are. So we can go around and, and, and chase and think, oh, how awful that person is or how sinful, whilst at the same time we can self-justify our own actions, our own behaviours, just in, in the pursuit of elevating ourselves to a more than holy thou position. But can I tell you that when each one of us stands before the holy God, we will be on our knees. Because see, our world says allow jobs, allow careers, allow wealth, allow housing, allow schooling, allow education to measure and evaluate yourself. Stop allowing the world to evaluate who you are. Allow the holiness to expose you and bring you to your knees. And as daunting as that may sound, can I tell you, I think it's the most freeing thing in this world. When the world says this is how you should measure your life and you think, man, I cannot do it. As the world says, hey, here's what it means. Here's have an identity like this, have this and that, and all will be good. And you think, man, but the whole thing, that seems too dawning. I think it's actually freeing because it actually measures and exposes every single one of us and puts us on the same playing field. Because the world says it's about me and my identity. But God is showing and he's speaking and revealing himself to Moses. And he says, he's showing Moses that your identity, Moses, is Nothing. In comparison to my identity, I am who I am. And that's why Moses has to hide his face. So, the reason we don't weep over our own sin is I th <laughs> the reason we struggle to weep over sin, the reasons we struggle to say sorry is I think, well, actually, yeah, it's because we've failed to see a holy God. We failed to see and realize the true holiness of a holy God who is transcendent. Because when we do and we get a glimpse and as we encounter God, it brings us to our knees and cries out, woe is me. So you may not have had a burning bush moment, but there may have been a moment where you encountered God where someone came along and shared Jesus with you and you realized the holiness of God. I was just thinking about this this week. Like, you know, as men, oh man, you might be different. I like to fix things. I fix cars. I fix stuff comes in front of me. You know, when my wife comes and shares about a week and she's sharing how she's feeling and da da da, guess what I try to do? Let's stop, let's stop worrying about the feelings. Let's fix the problem. I don't know whether men you do that. Like, let's fix it. I'm here. Well, let's fix this problem. And so often we try to fix our problems. We try to man up. We try to do more. We try to, to become more. But the holiness of God just, it just blows that dilemma out of the water. It creates a huge dilemma for us because it's no longer safer for you or me to encounter a holy God. And so then how can we, how then can we survive such an encounter with a holy God then? Because at one moment, the, you know, it's, it's mesmerizing, but at the other moment we've got to hide our face. How can we survive that? Because, well, here it is, because God reveals his grace and mercy to Moses. 
See, we're going to see that God reveals his grace and his mercy now in this passage. At the same time he reveals his holiness, his transcendence, he's going to reveal that God has come to us. What that means is he's imminent. He's above us, but we must never think that he is so distant, that he is away. But we need to be reminded that he is imminent. He is in the lives of his people. Have a look at verse 8. So I have come down to rescue them. See, God comes among us. See, here is the problem with other religions. Say with Islam, they believe that God is transcendent, but that's it. You've got to ascend. You've got to transcend. Other religions will say, no, no, no. Creation is God. So God is creation. Now, that's a problem. Christianity, no, no, no. Christianity says, yes, God is above us. He's transcendent. But at the same time, God is among us. He has come down to us. See, the Garden of Eden. In the cool of the evening, God would walk with Adam and Eve. But at the same time, he was above us. But we broke that problem. We, you know, we, we caused a problem with that relationship. We sinned. The Tower of Babel, guess what man tried to do? They tried to ascend. We're always trying to ascend because deep down, whether we know it or not, there is a big problem with us. And so we try through our jobs, through our careers, through our families, through marks at schools, through moral behavior. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't sleep around, and I've got very well men and kids. I honor my parents. We use those things to try and ascend to God, but we can never ascend. But how gracious and merciful is God that he actually descends. He comes to us. He came to Jacob down the stairs. We could never transcend the heights to be in God's glory and to be amongst his holiness. But God comes down, did you notice that, to rescue the, from them from the hand of Egypt. See, this points to something even bigger, right? Because nearly 1,500 years later, God comes down to us. The Son of God breaks into this world as flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And in verse 13... It says, God came down and he dwelt among us. Now, it's interesting because the word dwelt among us is tabernacled. See, the book of Exodus, the rest of the book of Exodus is going to show us how can a holy God dwell among unholy people. And we get to Jesus and here is the temple. Here is how you can. Because Jesus comes down and he goes to a cross. How can we stand as unholy people in front of a holy God? It's because the Lord Jesus Christ consumed the wrath of God that should have consumed each one of us on the cross. He came down to save us so that you and me, those who trust in Christ, can now stand before a holy God. He came down and through his life, death and resurrection, we can come into his presence eternally. So he comes to us, but here's the final bit. He's also with us. So it doesn't matter who you are, Moses, it's me. As Moses is exposed, God is saying, I've got this. See, the great I am is with you. He's with us. See, God is showing Moses that your identity doesn't matter, Moses. What truly matters is what What truly matters is that I am, and that the I am is with you. Have a look at verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I? That's an identity question. That's a suitability question. He says, I don't measure up. I cannot do this. It's a failure. I'm a failure in life. And now what does the Western world do with that kind of stuff? What would an Egyptian worldview do with that? They would say, let's build self-esteem. Doesn't it? What do you do with your kids at sport? We give them a pat on the back all the time. (laughs) You can do better. Pull your jocks up, pull, pull them up. You, you, know, you, you can do better, work harder. What do we do in the Western world if someone has fallen and they're in a messy place and they aren't able? We'll go, you can do it. Come on. You, you can find greatness. You are great. You can do this. And so when we get to verse 12, we're sort of expecting that God's going to sort of give him a morale boost. He's going to give him a self-esteem boost. But God doesn't do that. Have a look at verse 12. Like I'm expecting he's going to say, no, you can do it, Moses. It's okay. Give you a pat on the back. And what does God say? What does a God who transcends creation says? I will be with you. 
the transcendent God who was above says, I will be with you. In fact, what he's saying is you're with me. It's not about you. It's not about your identity. But you're with me on this. See, what we need is not self-morale or self-esteem. Is We just need a greater sense of the presence of God. The great I am is with us. See, in the book of John, we, 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 we see who Jesus more is. See, here in Exodus chapter 3, I am who I am. And we get to John chapter 8 and Jesus is speaking to these religious leaders. They're, they're in him. They're having a go at him and they go, no, no, you're not the Messiah. And what does Jesus say to these Pharisees? What does he say to these leaders? He says this, he says, Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. And what is their response after that? Because they totally know what Jesus is saying when he says, I am. He, they want to kill him. They want to crucify him. How dare you? They know exactly who it is. As Revelation says, he is who is, who was, and who is to come. That is who I am. I am the great I am. And they want to crucify him because he has just told them who he really is. And Jesus says, you want to know, you know what the sign is? You want to know that I am? I am. He says, you'll see the Son of God lifted up on a cross. That's how you know I am who I am. The God who came to us was crucified, was buried, and he rose again so that you and me can stand in the holiness of God, in the presence of God Almighty. And he says, I am who I am. So it makes the words of Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, even more powerful, doesn't it? When the I am, I am, the great I am says to us, go and make disciples of all nations. And what does he say? I am with you always. Sure thing, Jesus, but it's going to come with a cost, isn't it? When you say go and make disciples, yeah, it's going to be costly. It's going to be costly. I'm working too much. I don't have time. Do you know how much it's going to cost me? Do you know what it means for me? And Jesus says, I'm with you. You're with me. We have, we have a 58-year-old woman here in our congregation who says, I'm going to Thailand at the end of this year because Jesus says, I am with you. And as we go out, as we may go, maybe you're here today and you're thinking, no, I could never go to Bible college. You know, Jesus says, I am who I am. See, Moses, he's expecting a sign. <laughs> God gives him a sign, but the sign is after it's done. He says, when you see me do this, then you'll know that I am who I am. So he doesn't give him a sign to say, go and step out now. He says, no, you'll see that I am who I am. And so we step out in faith, knowing that Jesus says, I am who I am. And just like Moses in verse 1, who's washed up, he's a washed up old man who has no identity. God makes himself known to him. We too are nobodies who God has made himself known to us. And we will cry out sometimes, God, I cannot do this. God, where are you in this? God, I cannot take that step. God, I do not measure up. God, I cannot succeed. And Jesus says, you can't, but I am. Let's pray. Father, give us a bigger glimpse of your holiness. Bring us to our knees. But thank you for making a way through the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can come into your presence. Lord, you, you know us. And yet, Father, you say, <laughs> Jesus says to us, I am with you always. Lord, help us never to forget that and never to move on from that wonderful truth. Amen.